I'm Robert Grant, and this is The Codex. As a prodigious entrepreneur, Robert Grant is a modern-day polymath who has seamlessly integrated his innovations across mathematics, sciences, and the arts by transforming them into balanced creations designed to benefit humankind. Grant utilizes alternative base number systems, like the base 12 or the geodecimal system when formulating his groundbreaking equations. Equally significant, Robert Grant has a profound intuitive connection to Leonardo da Vinci. Grant has successfully decoded some of da Vinci's greatest secrets embedded within his most celebrated works of art. What esoteric meanings lie behind the precision and geometry of da Vinci's masterpieces? And how did Robert Grant come to decode them? What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? The history that we have been told and shown, how are they potentially different from our new reality? Is what we've been experiencing our whole lives actually leading and culminating to some bigger story? And how, if it is, could we ever find that? One of the people that I've looked to my entire life is Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was born in 1452 in Italy, referred to as the greatest polymath of all time. He was clearly a genius mind who could span multiple different disciplines. And one of the things he's most famously noted for is that he was an incredible cryptographer. Of the 20 or so paintings that he left as masterpieces, most of them are still studied vigorously today for their hidden encryptions and have been the subject of film and other mainstream programming to basically show us all what da Vinci was trying to tell us. Probably his most enigmatic painting, of course, is the Mona Lisa. But the one that stands out as most recognizable to all humans today is the Vitruvian Man. And in it, Leonardo tried to answer this question of squaring the circle. Because this age-old mystery of squaring the circle somehow represented, even as far back as the ancient Greeks, some merger of consciousness. The feminine, represented by the circle, and the masculine, represented by the square. The concept of squaring the circle basically involves constructing a square with an equal surface area to a circle, or vice versa, using nothing more than a compass and straight edge. Leonardo da Vinci's drawing of a male figure perfectly inscribed in a circle and square, the Vitruvian Man, illustrates what he believed to be a divine connection between the human form and the universe. It was believed by ancient Greeks for thousands of years that if we could successfully, without measurement, square a circle, then we would be able to achieve a balanced consciousness in a super conscious way. That somehow, the very act of drawing the geometry out to square the circle would lead to irrevocable changes within the human psyche. Leonardo left for us an ensign. He left for us an archetype of squaring of the circle. But if we look at it, we'll notice that he didn't actually square the circle. In fact, his square wasn't a perfect square. I started sketching in my notebook, The Vitruvian Man, because I wanted to get into the mind of Leonardo. And one of the things I first noticed was is that I thought, I need to measure the angle between the navel and the upper left corners of the square. Because what Leonardo had done is he placed the square in a very unique position where the base of the circle was tangent to the base of the square. And when you measure it, the square doesn't actually measure the same area value. It's far too small. Da Vinci worked on this, according to Walter Isaacson, a noted biographer who wrote a complete story of his life. According to Walter Isaacson, Leonardo da Vinci was the co-author of a book on geometry called Divina Proportione, or Divine Proportion, in which they broke down the golden ratio and its application to geometry. 
through the visual arts of perspective and architecture, something da Vinci was a master at. So clearly he understood proportion, and yet the square turns out to be a different value than the circle in area. One of the things that Leonardo always did, and he did it also in The Vitruvian Man, is he always wrote in backwards mirrored text. In fact, when he doesn't write in backward mirrored text, we can assume that he did that for a reason. Though the exact reasoning behind Leonardo da Vinci's backwards writing may never be known, several researchers believe it was a way for him to hide his ideas from prying eyes of the Roman Catholic Church, whose teachings stood in opposition to many of da Vinci's observations and ideas. It would only make sense for him to encrypt his writings so as to protect himself from any possible persecution. What da Vinci was doing was showing us his cipher key to his encryptions. Because when da Vinci writes in the normal way forward, left to right without mirroring the text, he's actually telling us and giving us a hint that herein lies one of his famous encryptions. And as we look at the Vitruvian man, our deeper analysis shows us that he has hidden a lot more encryption. The iconic Vitruvian man, drawn circa 1490 by the great Leonardo da Vinci, is probably the most famous image of all time. And yet, for over five centuries, no one has noticed he encoded within it astounding knowledge of the Great Pyramid of Giza. I recently observed that the angle from the navel to the top corner of the square exactly matches the side slope angle of the pyramid. I asked cryptologist Alan Green to investigate da Vinci's masterpiece with the same mathematical rigor. What we found challenges our entire concept of what this enigmatic work of art is really about. It's widely known that the Great Pyramid embodies the ratio of the radiuses of the Earth and Moon. But Green realized that by inscribing a circle within da Vinci's square and raising that circle so its center coincides with the center of the Vitruvian Man circle at the navel, six perfect pyramid cross-sections are revealed, along with an exact geometrical match of the Earth moon pyramid relationship. Da Vinci states explicitly in the backwards mirrored text surrounding his image that its proportions are exact integer ratios of the whole man. And he has cut his man in 14 places, clearly identifying these proportions. In addition, he says, decrease the height of man by 1 14th, a second veiled reference to the Horus I myth in which Set cuts Osiris' body into 14 parts. So Leonardo seems to have encrypted the Great Pyramid of Giza into the proportions of the square versus the circle. He had to deliberately make that square too small to match the area. But actually what it's doing is it's encrypting for us the slope angle of the Great Pyramid of Giza. According to the Rhind Papyrus, the Seked of the Great Pyramid, which is the unit of measurement used by the pyramid builders, was five palms and two fingers per cubit. This unit of measurement allowed for the slope of the face of the pyramid to be 14 over 11, which is the mathematical relationship of phi. Interestingly enough, the inverse slope of its edges is 9 over 10, which gives us the relationship of pi. When used in conjunction, these two advanced mathematical formulas provide a stability to the Great Pyramid that isn't found in the other bent pyramids of the region. And for those of you that study and have studied the Great Pyramid, Egyptologists alike, you'll notice that the most important number that determines the volume of the Great Pyramid on the entire Giza Plateau is 51.843 degrees. And here da Vinci encrypted it 
right into the upper corner with both hands pointing exactly to it, as if begging us to look further here. It became clear that da Vinci had intimately profound knowledge about the pyramid. But is there any proof that da Vinci ever visited Egypt? Well, it happens that he wrote a letter that showed up in the Codex Atlanticus, which is a compendium of many of his sketches. What we do also notice is that this forward written letter that he left in the Codex Atlanticus, which is titled to the Devadar of the Lieutenant of the Sultan of Cairo, Babylon. And in this letter, he points out that he was working under an engagement for Sultan Kate Bey, a famous Mamluk Sultan to this day that is known as being a great philosopher king and being the creator of many archeological monuments and buildings that still stand to this day in Cairo. Da Vinci references in his letter that he arrived in Cairo. Now from 1482 until 1486, even Walter Isaacson doesn't know what happened to the historical record of Leonardo da Vinci. Some refer to this time period as the lost years of Leonardo's life. Leonardo da Vinci was considered one of the most famous people of his time. Most of his life was chronicled, except for a few lost years. Is it possible that the Codex Atlanticus points us to what he was doing during that undocumented period of time? And if so, what else might it reveal about what Leonardo da Vinci saw while in Egypt? But in this letter, da Vinci not only references arriving into Cairo, he also references the great Mount Taurus, chronicling his experience and review of that mountain in abject detail. This might actually be one of the reasons why art historians tend to believe that this is simply a fictional account, because his description is so colorful that they believe that it must not be real. In fact, he goes into such abject detail about the mountain, as well as his experience going inside of one of the chambers of that mountain, that he ends up having the reader believe, with the lack of knowledge, that he's referencing something altogether different. But Bull Mountain and his reference to Mount Taurus is well known to Egyptologists because that is the name of the Great Pyramid, Bull Mountain, signified by two chevrons and a bull, which represents the Apis Bull. Originally called Bull Mountain or Mount Taurus, the Great Pyramid at Giza was associated with Apis or Hep, which was the chief bull deity of Egypt. He was later renamed the Apis Bull by the Greeks. In the chronicles about Mount Taurus, or the Great Pyramid, Leonardo da Vinci wrote, The peaks of the great Mount Taurus to the west. These peaks are of such a height that they seem to touch the sky. And in all of the world, there's no part of the earth higher than its summit. And the rays of the sun always fall upon its east side four hours before daytime. And being of the whitest stone, it shines resplendently to fulfill the function of these. Though Leonardo da Vinci's colorfully detailed accounts of his time in Cairo have been perceived as a work of fiction by some historians, it is clear his understanding of the Great Pyramid appears more factual once the esoteric meanings behind his accounts are revealed. But what else might we glean from his writings? The original name of the Giza Plateau was not Giza. The original name was Ras Tau, the Rose Cross. In Greek, the word Taurus also means bull. It would be spelled, if we wrote it out in English, T-A-U-R-O-S. But if we read it backwards, it would be read as Ross Tau. Da Vinci had encrypted in this letter esoteric understanding and wisdom that only one who had understood the connection to the Alpha, which is the reference to the bull, the letter A, 
could potentially mean and make the connection back to the Great Pyramid. That, along with the 5184 degree reference, points irrevocably to something more during his time of his lost years, spending that time in Egypt. Da Vinci is here referencing in his encrypted form of this letter, his visitation and review, his personal observation of the pyramids of the Ross Tau Plateau. In addition, we also have to look more closely at Rosicrucianism. Ross Tau means Rose Cross. The Tau Cross, also a reference to the cross that Jesus was nailed to, shaped like the letter T. So the Great Pyramid has another perspective on it, and that is that each base side is between 755 and 756 feet, with slight variation at each one. But what we see is that, very interestingly, another reference to squaring of the circle is embedded within the proportional dimensions of the Great Pyramid. If we use the height of the Great Pyramid as a reference point to advise us of the radius of a circle. So when we look at this reference point and say that the radius of the circle would inform the height of the Great Pyramid of 481 feet or 280 cubits, and the side of its base would be 440 cubits or 756 feet. Then what we find is that it informs exactly the proper squaring of the circle, where the perimeter value will match the circular circumference value. Now there are two ways anciently to square the circle. One is to square it matching the area for the square and the area of the circle. This is the more prominent of the two methods of measurement. But what the Great Pyramid does is it goes and points us toward the second measurement, which is the perimeter of the square equaling the circumference of the circle. Speaking yet again to some relationship of this balance that the builders felt was necessary to communicate back to us. In our day, thousands of years later, in a living manifest of stone, somehow to the importance of this understanding. What we also see is that the Great Pyramid, when we understand that it's embedded within the Vitruvian Man, we start to find other encryptions deeply embedded within this image. Now, the magic. Da Vinci's lines reveal a perfect blueprint of the internal structure of the pyramid's chambers. Only the queen's chamber seems to be missing, but is it? Queen Isis, mourning the cutting of her husband's body into 14 parts, represents the 14 phases of the waning moon. Her reconstituting Osiris' body represents the 14 phases of the waxing moon. Da Vinci has precisely identified the presently known subterranean queen's and king's chambers, the ground level of the pyramid, its defining side angle, and its mathematical relationship to earth and moon centuries before these were supposedly known, which begs the question, do his upper lines represent presently unknown chambers? Da Vinci seems to be telling us the Great Pyramid hides a deeper esoteric symbolism that has ever been suspected a blueprint of man's unfolding spiritual journey through the sacred energy centers of the spine, known as the chakras. Perhaps finding these inner chambers in ourselves is our ultimate purpose, and the Great Pyramid but a metaphor for the true measure of mankind. So Leonardo da Vinci left us a blueprint of the Great Pyramid embedded within this iconic image of the Vitruvian man, where each line that is both horizontal and vertical, we have now only the conclusion to draw, are actually encrypted important locations 
of the Great Pyramid itself. Is it possible that these lines within Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man point not only to the chambers within the Great Pyramid, but to other chambers that we have yet to discover? In 2017, while Robert Grant was in Egypt visiting the Great Pyramid, a Japanese delegation was there called the Scan Pyramid Project. Using ground-penetrating radar and muon transfer technology to locate undiscovered voids within the great structure. The Japanese delegation had located a void space above the Grand Gallery that appears to lead exactly to the throat chakra line on the Vitruvian Man, indicating that where da Vinci has left us another horizontal line on the Vitruvian Man's body might be leading us exactly to the precise location of another chamber, heretofore undiscovered. Additionally, there are other lines at the forehead, at the pineal gland, and at the crown chakra. And further, there are lines very deep on both knees, potentially pointing us to other chambers that we just don't know about yet. What is it that Leonardo is trying to point us towards? He further gave us another encryption in his backward marriage text, where he references 1 over 14, which of course is relational to the Osiris mythology, where Set cuts his body into 14 parts and does the same by separating out the body of the Vitruvian man in 14 different places. But very interestingly, and something we cannot miss, is that Leonardo is potentially pointing us to something that relates directly to the perfect squaring of the circle. Because if we are to place a 1 14th separation of the Vitruvian man down at the base of the circle and center the square over that circle, it will give us exactly the location of placement of a square proportionally that would give us precisely the same area value as the circle thus fulfilling the ancient mystery that is believed to be impossible since 1882 to square the circle without any measurements whatsoever, using only a compass and a straight edge. I can't help but ask the question, maybe that the Great Pyramid is really a reflection of our own conscious progression that as we ascend to understand more about our own selves and our own consciousness is expanding through each of our chakra centers, that maybe we'll understand more of the mysteries of this reflection that we call the Great Pyramid. Join me in this journey through time and this journey around the globe as we crack this mystery left to us not only by Leonardo, but other Renaissance and ancient polymaths and philosophers who have been endlessly pointing us to the same conclusions, that the world is now on the brink of change as we enter a new age, an Aquarian Renaissance, that we'll be discovering and working on together throughout the course of this series. It may have an indelible impact on how you perceive your world around you, it might actually impact you to see the world in different terms and recognize that what we judge is what we attract until we no longer judge those things that we attract. Thank you for joining me on this episode of The Codex.